Hello, everyone. I'm Diane Stern. We welcome you to the Salem Athenaeum for a wonderful evening in store. We hope you like that video. It's one of uh, several that are new that were just recorded, and we're very proud of them. And we hope that they do lead to more membership and you know, more great ideas from our members for programs and events. Tonight, we have the pleasure of meeting two historical fiction authors whose books, published last year, take place in Concord during the time of Hawthorne, Emerson, Thoreau, Fuller, and the Alcott family. Tonight's conversation dovetails with last month's discussion of the transcendentalists in their world by Robert Gross. And I know some of you were on hand for that. We want to remind you to use the chat feature on your screen to ask questions of our guests. And you can find a link to purchasing the books also in the chat feature. We want to let you know the books are being supplied by our local bookstore, Wicked Good Books. And the Salem Athenaeum is actually handling the sales. And signed book plates are available as well. A reminder also to mute yourselves if you aren't already. I think you're all muted. So there are no sometimes embarrassing disruptions. And now to our program tonight, Don Zancanella, who wrote the book Concord, has won the John S. Simmons Iowa Short Fiction Award and an O. Henry Prize. One of his stories was cited as a distinguished story of the year in the 2019 Best American Short Stories. And another nominated for the 2021 Pushcart Prize. He's published widely in literary magazines, a native of Wyoming. He has lived, however, in Virginia, Colorado, Missouri, and he taught at the University of New Mexico. He studied with Thoreau and Emerson scholar, Robert Richardson, and he now lives with his wife and their rescued dog in Boise, Idaho. <laughs> now, Kate Dyke Blair, the author of The Hawthorne Inheritance, now lives in Concord but she grew up in a Vermont bookstore. She remembers lunches with Robert Frost, and towards the end of the program, I'd love to ask her about that. I know she has a few little anecdotes. A true bibliophile, Katie graduated with a degree in English Lit from Boston University, and she worked in area bookshops before specializing, taking a bit of a turn, in occupational health. She is a member of the union sag Afro and performs on stages and screens, large and small. And as an aside, I met Katie one year ago this month on the set of the new Netflix movie, Don't Look Up, which was filmed in Massachusetts. Perhaps you've already seen it. Katie is related to Nathaniel Hawthorne, which helps to explain at least some of her interest in her subject matter. Well, let's find out more about that and the lives of some very exceptional inhabitants of 19th century Concord with Kate Dyke Blair and Don Zancanella. And welcome to you both. Hey, thank thank you. you. Thank you, Diane. Um, Katie and I have spoken in advance and agreed that we're gonna try to have a conversation and kind of go back and forth um, sharing uh, our um, thoughts about uh, questions in common. And so um, Katie is going to start uh, us off by uh, summarizing her book a bit and also telling about the inspiration for it. So over to you, Katie. Thank you so much, Don. And thank you so much, Diane, for the lovely introduction and to the Salem Athenaeum for hosting us. Um, I'm gonna try sharing my screen now. Um, all righty. Come up here. All righty. So, um, as Diane said, I am related to Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, and the way I found that out was, first I'll tell you about my book. So the um, publisher, Sunbury Press, uh, the marketing guru for Sunbury Press came up with the log line or elevator pitch, which is the book kind of condensed into two sentences. And it is author Nathaniel Hawthorne's younger sister, Louisa drowns in the Henry Clay steamboat disaster of 1852. 
but was it really an accident? So here is Mr. Hawthorne. I think we are all familiar with him. He was, this, he was 37 when this picture was painted. Um, I am related to him because my great, great, great grand uncle, John Dyke, was married to Hawthorne's aunt Priscilla Manning. How did I find this out? From this gentleman. This is my father, Robert Dyke Blair. Diane told you a little bit about him already. He owned, he was the founder and owner and operator and genial proprietor of the Vermont Bookshop in Middlebury, Vermont. Here he is. He's a man outstanding in his field of books. Uh, we, he was um, affectionately called the genial prop. He would say, oh, geez, how, do you, how can you say that? Look at me. I couldn't prop up anything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in 2000, when he was when he was 70, he decided to sell the store because he could no longer remember his customers' names. And at 68, I can certainly relate to that. And then he suffered a few um, health-related incidents, and he ended up staying at home most of the time and being on his computer. And when he was on his computer, he did a lot of ancestry research. Um, when he died in 2009, my mother asked me to go through his office. And he was a bookman, so he had lots of interesting things in that office. There were many signed copies, many first editions. There was a reader's copy of George Orwell's 1984. And there was also a whole sheaf of documents that he had printed off the computer about the Dyke family. Um, and so I learned about that the Dykes had come over from Ireland in 1635 and that they had settled first in Plymouth. Um, they were particulars, not pilgrims. They were um, sailors and tradesmen, and they wound their way up to Beverly, and it was in Beverly that John Dyke was born. Um, John Dyke married Nathaniel Hawthorne's aunt Priscilla, uh, Priscilla Manning. Um, but the other thing that I thought was so interesting when I was reading his research was that not only had John married Priscilla Manning, but Strangely enough, he was with Louisa on that boat that we talked about just a little while ago, the Henry Clay steamboat disaster. Um, why was she with him? Why was he with her? And where was his wife? I thought that was very interesting. And, and my father just looked at it as dry history, but I thought that was very odd. Um, I wondered where his wife was. I wonder why they had gone to uh, um, vacation in Saratoga Springs, just the two of them, just John and Louisa. She was 44, he was 69. 25-year age difference, not that big a deal, especially at that time when women died in childbirth. Even today, you know, 25-year difference is not that different. If you think about somebody like Catherine Zeta-Jones and Michael Douglas, 25-year difference is not that big. So I thought something, something is fishy about this. Why were John and Louisa on this boat together? Um, the other thing that I thought was odd, here is, here is the lithograph of the Henry Clay steam, steamboat disaster. Um, if you can look carefully at this, you'll see in the front and the foreground, there are people here who are drowning because they jumped overboard because the boat itself is in, engulfed in flames in the, in the midsection. But if you look to the right there, you'll see that um, people, the captain had turned the boat to the shore and people were jumping off. So Louisa drowned, but John survived by jumping off onto shore. And I thought, okay, so if she was his caretaker, why were they not together? Why did, he, why did she drown and he survived? And that was the inspiration for my research into it and for the story in general. So I will now stop my share here. And I will ask Don. So Don, what was the inspiration for your book? So it's very interesting, uh, Katie, because yours is so personal, and mine is um, a topic that I was interested in, but don't have any personal connection to at all. I grew up out west, and and the transcendentalists were always people in a book, um, not people that I had any sense of uh, of their real life uh, in connection with my life. But I was a high school teacher, and when I used to talk to students about um, people like Thoreau and uh, Emerson. I think they always saw them as uh, old men with gray beards. And um, I, I would try to tell them that that wasn't necessarily the case, that those people were young once as well. And um, my novel Concord focuses on uh, Thoreau and Margaret Fuller and Hawthorne when they were younger, when they before they were the people that we think about uh, as being these sort of literary icons today. 
Um, I think visiting uh, Concord and Salem and, and Boston at various times um, helped make me more interested in it. And there were certain moments. Um, I remember one moment of being uh, visiting the old manse and uh, being in the, um, one of the bedrooms on the second floor and seeing where uh, Sophia Peabody had inscribed some words on a pane of glass with Nathaniel when they were newlyweds. Fuck. And it was one of those moments that, um, that I felt kind of as if the ghosts were in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the, uh, you, um, the mention at the beginning, Diane mentioned that I studied with a, a man named Robert Richardson, who was a biographer of uh, Thoreau and of Emerson as well. And uh, he, uh, he was very good at bringing those people to life in his classroom and at, um, at giving you a sense of who they were in their, in their time, placing them in the time and in the, the, the location and the, uh, uh, where they lived. And unfortunately, he died just shortly before my book came out, died in uh, a couple of years ago. But um, I think he was also an influence. And so I think for me, almost everything I write, I think of as kind of a mosaic of forces coming together or a mosaic of pieces coming together. Mm -hmm. And um, and so there was never one, uh, you know, one impetus or one inspiration for it. Um, I, sometimes something very small can make a difference too. I mm -hmm. remember reading a remark from the uh, critic Malcolm Cowley saying that there aren't many there aren't many love stories in the history of American writers, but one of the ones that is definitely a true love story is Sophia Peabody and Nathaniel Hawthorne, mm -hmm. and that stuck with me. I read that probably 15 years ago, and somehow um, when I started to write. Uh, this novel that I think came back to me as well. So those are some of the things that caused me to to be interested in writing this. Um, but uh, uh, I wanted to ask one of the things I wanted to ask you, Katie, was about your sense of of history and the relationship between history and fiction, especially given the fact that so much of your book comes from personal experience and from your father's research. Uh, it's your book is it, it is a novel it's clearly a novel it's not a um, a memoir or a work of family history and so i'm curious about how you make decisions about the push and pull between the authentic facts of history and the choices you make as a fiction writer right well i i had a point to prove i i really truly thought that louisa's story needed to be told. And I, I almost felt like she was on my shoulder asking me to tell her story. Um, I don't know about you, but I personally had never heard of Louisa Hawthorne. I knew about Neff, obviously. I knew about E.B., his older sister, but I knew nothing about Louisa. I'd never, I've never heard of her. And, and you know, I didn't know anything about the Henry Clay steamboat disaster. Um, and so I, there was a part of me that really thought her story should be told. And I also, as you just said, you know, love is universal. And um, for you, it was Sophia and, and Naf, and for me, it was Louisa and John. I really thought that they had a love story that needed to be told. So because I, because I suppose I had an ax to grind, mm -hmm. I needed, I had, I, I had um, a structure that I needed to follow, which was her life. Um, and I need, and I, and it needed to come, uh, the, the sort of the, the, um, Apex was um, her death on the Henry Clay steamboat disaster, and then trying to figure out, you know, how 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 el what else to tell about her tale. So so I had to keep to those historical points. And um, one of the things that I decided to do was to instead of write about them, was to write in their voices. So Louisa speaks in her journals, and she speaks in the first person present. And if you look at her journals, all of her journals have colors. Um, there's the red, there's the, she begins with the white journal, and then she goes to the red journal, and then she goes to, you know, all these different colors of the journals, and they actually, they, they actually show this, the uh, arc of her life until we have the black journal when she dies. Um, and the, the dates that I've chosen are, are very specific. For instance, her mother died in 1850, and, and so did Margaret Fuller. Those were hu huge for her. Um, 
uh, when she when she went through puberty and she and, and she and Nath were in the dancing um, uh, dance club and she met and she began to have those feelings for for John. You know, I wanted her to be around 12 for that. Um, when she and this is true, when, when I, I also went to the old manse and I talked to the docents there, Louisa actually really did have dinner with Thoreau and Margaret Fuller with the Hawthorns at, right after they had gotten married. Um, and so I used that. And then I used Una's birth in, in 1844 as another place for them to all get together and for Louisa and John to have a, a time together. So I used those dates very specifically and I used her life very specifically. Um, now, did I fudge some things? Yes. <laughs> I used the years, but um, people who know me will notice that some of the dates are birthdays, like mine and my husband's and other people's birthdays. Um, uh, so Louisa and John, when they went when they went to Saratoga Springs, actually took the stage there, but that would have taken too long, and I didn't want to write about a long stage journey, so I, put, I had them take the train. But they did take the Henry Clay home, or almost home. Um, so those were the kinds of, de of decisions that I made, was it was, I, I really wanted to prove a point. And then the other side of the story, of course, was John Stevens Dyke, who was John's um, son, who was the narrator, sort of the person who brought everything together. His life also, uh, I, I was very specific about the dates that I used for him, when he was married, uh, when, his, when, his, when John died, all those kinds of things were very specific. Um, so that, that's how I decided how to use history and how to use the dates. Um, I think in your book, I'm not sure you use dates. Is that true? You were you sort of I, I didn't, and and it's partly to avoid, you know, being pinned down um, <laughs> by historians saying that there's, you know, that this didn't happen at, at this exact date. I think right. al almost all writers of historical fiction either st stretch time or compress it, or probably do a little bit of both, right. um, because otherwise you're left with great um, kind of boring chunks of time where not much happens and and you have to and it helps with pacing to be able to do that too so you're right you noticed that i didn't uh include dates and i think if if someone if a historian who knows the period uh read my novel they would sense that it feels like it happens more quickly in my novel than it actually happened in other words my novel feels like maybe a year or two have passed when it, some of the things that probably takes in closer to three or four years of time, or at least aspects of it. And that was for the purpose of narrative pacing, I think mm. so. Mm. Yeah. But you, but I mean, you did some of the, some similar research to mine. So yeah. I, you know, I, I certainly recognized things in your book that were also in mine and vice versa. So Sure. Right. I mean, yeah. yeah, but I think you always make those choices. And I think that some readers, I think that readers range in terms of how tolerant they are of um, changes that fiction writers make to history. And I think that some people really want it to be accurate or they want it to be, you know, they want to be able to say, I went to this and I read this novel and I learned about these people in this time. Uh, and my response is, partly to say that if you really want to learn the history, read history. If you want to learn about the, the, the real facts of a person, read a biography, but that's not exactly what a work of historical fiction does. And I'm pretty tolerant in my own reading of people who, who make sometimes even pretty dramatic changes. Um, I think that, uh, that the internet and you know Google and so on has kind of changed everything because I often yeah. talk to people and they'll say, "Well, you know, I read that uh, scene or I heard or I read um, something that you said, and so I immediately Googled it to see if it was true." <laughs> um, and and usually, I think that that at least in Concord, it's most of what's there is is Googleable. You could Google it and you could find out that it really did happen and it really was true, but. Um, but there are, you know, I would be, a, if I read a, a novel and it says a novel on the cover, then I assume that there are some changes and that I should um, immerse myself in the characters and the events and not worry too much about the historical accuracy of it. Um, so right. I don't know. How, yeah, yeah and, would, and, and the emotions come through. I mean, that's the emotions that people can't Google, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I think that the another thing that happens, I think, is the including various people or leaving out various people. Right. And that to me, um, the that whole life in Concord uh, around Emerson was so rich in, you know, whole range of people visiting and and a lot of those people I just couldn't include. They were they were, you know, his house was sort of a you know alive with visitors from Boston and and um, and I at a certain point I realized that it was just too many characters. Um, and I think you had the same problem I did, which was so many people had the same name. There were yeah, a lot yeah. of Nathaniels, there were a lot of yeah. Samuels, there were a lot yeah. of Louises. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so so we sort of had to either I either left people out or yeah. I renamed them and I think you had the same you did right. the same thing right yeah right. and I, I did speak to some of that in an author's note but I still think it's that if it says novel on the cover then unless it's a really naive reader they probably should assume that some of that's happening right um, as well right so um another question I had for you Katie is if uh, surprises, things you learned, things that you didn't expect going into the writing of the book that maybe either through research or for the writing process you discovered uh, about the people or the time or anything. Well, actually what I learned about was myself. Okay, <laughs> I learned that I had to be tenacious because mm -hmm. I started this book in 2009, and I went through so many drafts and so many alpha and beta readers. Thank you to all my alpha and beta readers. Thank you to the editors that helped me. Thank, uh, thank you to everybody. But I had to be tenacious because I, I went through a lot of changes. Um, the book started out being very different. The book started out being a current day historical novel. And it turns out that I don't write current day stories very well. And so I was told by several editors that I should really start just thinking about doing it in, as an historical book. And that was, that was very interesting to learn about myself. And it doesn't really surprise me. I mean, here I, you know, I spent a lot of time in my father's bookstore reading a lot of Louisa May Alcott and a lot of uh, Conan Doyle and a lot of, you know, books that were written in that kind of cadence. And mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. even my speaking style sometimes is that cadence. And so I learned that that was really my strength. Um, and, and I learned how to take punches. I learned that, you know, people didn't necessarily think that I, that my book was ready for publishing, even though I did. Mm -hmm. um, I learned a lot about my, my own family history. Um, I did not know a lot about either my Dyke ancestry or my Blair ancestry. And those two things, um, when it, when it became obvious that I would, was really only going to write an historical novel, then I had to figure out how I was going to do that. And that's when John Dyke's uh, son, John Stephen Dyke, sort of raised his head and said, here, me, me, choose me. And it was that, and that's why I chose him to be the narrator. And then, oh, gosh, the Blairs then come into, into play because, you know, his nephew was my great, great, great grandfather. So there you go. Um, and that, that was I did a lot of research on that, um, and I'm grateful that I, uh, my, my great, my grandfather had done a lot of research himself, and so I was able to read his, uh, his book called Meet the Blairs, and in Meet the Blairs, I learned a lot about my Bland, Blair ancestry, and I was able to incorporate that into the book as well. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot. <laughs> uh, interesting. Yeah, I think about yourself, have, what, yeah. what, did, what did you learn? What it, one of the things that, um, I mean, there were, I always hasten to say that I, I was not a scholar of 19th century American literature, and I'm still not a scholar of 19th century American literature, despite the writing of this novel, that I researched with an eye toward getting as much as I needed to write the novel. And then I stopped. And, um, and I think that sometimes that people, that surprises people, but I, uh, I wanted to write about the, the, the youth of these characters when they were in their 20s, thereabouts. Or, and so if somebody asks me, you know, what happened to Margaret Fuller after your novel ends, my response is, well, you know, I, I may know a little bit about that, but not very much because I did. That's not part of the, the, um, the scope of what I was doing because mm -hmm. I really approached it as a fiction writer wanting to create this world. Um, but uh, 
but there were some things that I definitely back to the question about discoveries. Uh, one of my big discoveries was the Peabody sisters was uh, Elizabeth and Mary and um, Sophia Peabody. Uh, I just, you know, I did not, I had never learned much about them, really maybe anything about them. And, and they were so interesting. And Elizabeth, Elizabeth was such a force in kind of uh, Boston life and intellectual life of that time. Um, she's maybe the, the minor character that I found most interesting to write about because uh, even though the, my novel is narrated by uh, Thoreau and uh, Margaret Fuller and Sophia, um, she is kind of in the background making things happen. And so that um, very much interested me. So learning about them was very interesting. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, that was, some, that was a, a, in terms of my own writing process, and, uh, I think that um, I had, I mean, I've written for a long time, so I don't think that I discovered that much except the usual things about, um, as you say, persistence and kind of the value of, of, um, of not, you know, not giving up and staying with the project and so on. But um, I, I also, I think I, I, I discovered um, the value of primary sources too, because I hadn't really written anything that depended so much on primary sources, on Hawthorne's mm -hmm. journals and the letters. And, and eventually I, I started out by reading biographies and then kind of set those aside and started spending all my time with primary sources. And that uh, has made a difference in other projects where I've realized that's where you really need to go if you want to get the feel and the sound and biographies can sketch in the whole arc of the life, but the specifics for fiction writing purposes are in the primary sources. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, you, you want to hear their voices so you, yeah. Can, yeah. you, can, you can represent them. Yeah. yeah. So um, can you talk a little bit about your uh, own writing process, just the nuts and bolts of it, Katie? That you sure. talked about the, the aspects like persistence and so on, but what about your, your you know, maybe more specific writing process? Um, so early on, um, my writing process really involved just kind of, um, I, I think what they call it is vomiting onto the page, <laughs> right? Just write as much as you can. Um, and those were the things that my poor alpha readers uh, suffered through. Um, and as I got, I, I began to finesse that a little bit. What I discovered was, as you say, if I go back to, I went back to the primary sources and I read letters, family letters of the siblings, of the Hawthorne siblings. I read family letters of the Dykes. Um, John Stevens Dyke was, was Hawthorne's oh. best friend. And so there were a lot of, um, excuse me, there were a lot of uh, letters between the two of them and I could hear their voices and I could hear the humor in their letters. Um, and then I, as I said, I really felt as though I, as though I were channeling Louisa and she really, I, I would, I would sort of just, I, you know, I would get up in the morning and I would just start writing and I would write one of her journal entries. Um, and then I would take a walk. I, I often would walk up to, I think you've been there to the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery to Authors Ridge. And I would just walk up there and I would stand by their graves and I would just kind of stare at them and say, okay, what do you want me to write? And uh, I would walk back and I'd come home and the next day I would write another journal entry or I would write um, something from John or I would write about, you know, somebody, I'd write in somebody's voice. Um, and at the end when I was writing, when I, when I finally decided to have um, John Stevens Dyke be the narrator, that went so quickly. I wrote, I wrote his chapters in about a month and everything else had taken me a much longer time. But because I think I had his voice in my head too from all the research that I had done about with of them, hearing them, hearing John Stevens Dyke, reading all, my, all, all the different um, family letters and things, for some reason it just clicked. And I, I just had his voice in my head and I had, I had his, uh, he, you know, he, he suffers from migraines. And he suffers from, from PTSD, from Priscilla being so evil. Um, and it, for some reason, that just clicked. And I just started writing, and I couldn't stop. And I, I really, truly, I wrote for about a month. Um, and when I sent that to, I, I had an agent at the time. And when I sent her those chapters, she said, that's it. That's it. That's great. That is your book. 
so that, go ahead. so I was going to say so so that was right my writing process a lot of it just had to do with listening to them you know I mean I mean I'm an actor so I listen I have you have to listen when you act um, and I listen to their voices yeah I think in my case there that um, you make me think about a couple of um, moments or experiences that I had one was having uh, been a teacher uh, the discovery or the the looking into the fact that both um, Henry and Margaret Fuller had been teachers. Uh, those are the first pieces I wrote. And I, I just, it was kind of fun to try to capture an imagined scene of Henry in the classroom. And also then to try to capture an imagined scene of Margaret in the classroom. And so those, I think that's where I got a sense of maybe the voice that I would be writing in. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, this often happens to me, I write and write and write. And then at a certain point, I get a sense of the larger um, design, the larger shape that, uh, the, that a piece is going to take. And in this case, it was uh, when I realized that it there were really three love stories that I could work around. Mm -hmm. There was um, Margaret Fuller's uh, kind of unrequited um, affair of the mind with Emerson. Um, and um, uh, Henry's kind of competitive um, love of, Ella, of a girl named Ellen Sewell, which is his brother, uh, John, was also in love with. Yeah. And, then the, and then the kind of um, what Malcolm Cowley called the true love story of uh, Sophia and Nathaniel. Once I got that, then it was like, oh yeah, I can see how these three love stories can, can make a make a novel or they can fit together in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's uh, interesting to see, to look, to kind of look back on it. Um, maybe the last question before we go to the, if, see if there are questions from the, from the uh, people who are with us today. Uh, the last question I have for you is about uh, the relevance of your novel for contemporary readers. Um, it's, uh, I mean, historical fiction, I think is always asked, or some people will ask that of it, like, why should I read about these events that happened so long ago? Mm. Well, um, love is always relevant, right? And I, you're, you, you had your three love stories, and I have my love story. Um, love is always relevant. But for me, I I'm going to go back again to say I had an axe to grind. And I really wanted this to be, I wanted Louise's story to be told. Um, the Henry Clay steamship disaster has been talked about. It was litigated. People knew about it. Um, and, you know, it's been put to rest by, by most of the historians that I read. But for me, I, and again, I will say, you know, I wanted Louise's story to be told and I wanted the two of their, their stories to be told, their love story to be told. Um, so I'm hoping that that's relevant today. The, the feedback that I've gotten from readers has been that they, that they think that it's, that it's interesting and important and are happy to know that, first of all, to know who Louisa Hawthorne was, especially people who live here in Concord are like, I didn't know there was a Louisa Hawthorne. Mm -hmm. um, and what exactly, you know, was there, what, what was the actual truth that happened, I think, or, or maybe, or maybe there's a question about what the truth was. And I think that's the relevance for me as, and as I say, you know, I think, I think um, even in this day and age of Twitter and Instagram, you know, the, the Hawthorns had their letters and their, their journals, and yeah, that's, that's the, that's their Instagram. So I think all, all of those things are still relevant today. All of those relationships are still relevant. Yeah, I think in my case, the um, and maybe this goes back to to uh, Robert Richardson's classes and the way he approached the the uh, transcendentalists. Um, the sense that it that isn't it remarkable that these people were in the same place at the same time, and to what extent uh, did they did they cause each other to become who they became? Or to what extent was it just a historical accident that all their paths crossed? I mean, Emerson was bringing them to Concord partly, and, and but also they were, it's just it, that these people were, were um, in this place at this time seems kind of incredible. Uh, and it has made me, or I, I guess I would, 
it's made me think about collaboration and about uh, the way that there are, um, it's made me more aware of the value of, of like intellectual collaboration. There was a, a, a psychologist that I worked with at the University of New Mexico, whose name was Vera John Steiner. And she wrote a book called Notebooks of the Mind, which is entirely made up of essentially case studies of uh, intellectual collaboration, how people have worked together and how in many cases what they produced could not have been produced if they were working independently of one another. Yes. And so if I was trying to, um, you know, I guess sell my novel as something other than strictly a novel as having some kind of purpose, it might be partly about that, about these people whose lives cross and something greater comes out of that, um, you know, set of interactions. But um, I'm also, I, go ahead. I was gonna say, and I, and I think, especially with your book, you bring in the women, you know, that it wasn't uh, just men, it was women too. Yeah. It was Margaret Fuller and Sophia and the, and the Peabody sisters, you know, they were all very important in, in the sort of the, if you want to look at the arc of feminism, certainly they were very important people in there. Yeah. Yeah, it's surprising how many people even now are not very aware of even Margaret Fuller. I mean, I will talk to people and they'll say, I didn't know, I really didn't know anything about Margaret Fuller, um, which is kind of shocking maybe, but uh, I'm looking at the chat questions, um, Katie, and uh, let's see. Um, First one from Diane says, is there a particular reason, Don, that you were drawn to the romantic use period of these characters, including the courtship of Nathaniel and Sophia? And uh, I think it was a sense that that was a missing, that, that was something I didn't know much about and it was missing. But also I think the the fact that they started out as teachers was interesting to me. Mm -hmm. That before they were writers, they were teachers. And, and um, so it, it, led me in that direction, I guess. Um, that's probably And, and I would say your depiction of, the, of their teaching and some of the horrible things that they were expected <laughs> to do and then refused, mm -hmm. I thought was fascinating. Oh, yeah. yeah. And they were, they were obviously such wonderful teachers. And the female students of uh, Margaret Fuller, they adored her. I mean, mm -hmm. at least in your book. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it was just, it was lovely. It was great to read Thank that. You. Yeah. That was yeah. great. And then we have another question, Katie, um, uh, that says, um, going to find your books, but I'm not a believer in historical fiction because as a former professor in old school, I am not wanting to believe something about my historical friends that might mislead my understanding. Hmm. Um, how do you counter possible critics like me uh, to give this genre a stamp of approval? Well, so, I would say, you know, just keep an open mind and maybe you, maybe you, I, maybe we won't change your mind, mm -hmm. but you could still read it and maybe you'll find something else that's interesting about it. I, I, I understand. Maybe you don't. I mean, it's very possible that there, that people who read my book throw it down and say, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. That's okay. That's okay. You know, I, I, it was my, it was my calling. And just because it was my calling doesn't mean that it has to be any that, that, no, that anybody else has to believe it. It's I'm I'm putting it out there in the world, and if someone um, wants to think it's ridiculous, that's okay. Yeah, uh, I, I think at least in the case of 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 my novel Concord, I don't think there's. I would be really interested, I guess, if if a historian said, "No, you got that this wrong. That wasn't." How this person truly was or this wasn't how these events transpired because there's not a case and i can imagine myself writing something where i did where i was more um radical in the departure i made from history but in this case i, I feel like it's pretty much based on what you know what i know about them from research and and so i'd be surprised if there was anything that was upsetting to someone's view of that world um, but you never know. Well, and, and I will say that if you, if you take our two books, right, um, we have very different views of Hawthorne's sisters. 
right? Mm -hmm. Your view of Hawthorne sisters was that they were always in black and, you know, right, right, right. right. True. And that True. was, and that wasn't, and that wasn't my view of, of his sisters. Yeah, so yeah. even there, you know, there were some differences. You read the letters and you, and you listen, and you um, listen to the voices and you hear maybe what you hear, what you want to hear, or maybe you use what you think you hear to go on with your agenda. That's possible, you know, but <laughs> we weren't living then. We don't know. We don't know for sure what happened. We can only surmise. Right. And uh, in fact, there is a question here that says, I'm grateful for the genre of historical fiction. Um, it makes the characters more approachable. And she thanks you both. I mean, it's historical fiction. It's not you know, history. This is what happened. Um, so you can think of it that way too. Right. And I made very clear in my author's note that this was fiction because mm -hmm. I I don't want to I don't want to offend anybody or anything like that. So I just wanted to make sure that it was fiction. But this is what I felt and believed. And so you do is, too, Don. Correct? Yeah. And I, yes. I and, and I, I guess I, I am. As I said, I don't consider myself a scholar of that time or those people. And I and in my own case, I I think when I and maybe it's because often when I'm reading a historical novel, I don't have a real strong sense of ownership over the the, the people and the place or anything like that. So I usually don't, I just approach it as a novel, I think. Like when I read, um, you know, trying to think of a recent historical novel, the, the Hillary Mantel novels the, about Cromwell. Um, yes. Those, you know, I, I just, oh. I, I, I didn't really care if it was accurate or not because by page 50, I was immersed in her version yeah. of Cromwell and her version of those events. And I suppose if I knew a huge amount about them, maybe that I would stop and say, oh, this is you know bothersome. But um, I just, I don't read historical fiction that way. I don't read fiction that way, I guess. So. But that's interesting that you bring this up because I, I read that trilogy um, a few months ago. It was one of my, <laughs> my pandemic um, fiction reads. Um, and I did exactly what you talked about. I Googled all of these people to find out what was what <laughs> yeah. was true and what was not. And I wanted to see pictures of them too. Mm -hmm. I wanted, because you know she did just such a great job of describing them um, and find out you know who really was beheaded and those kinds of things. And that's why I'm grateful to historical fiction because it leads me to the, the, the history and I learn something. I learn a lot just from, from, from reading the historical fiction, Googling it, going back and forth, and the, the historical fiction helps cement it in my brain somehow. Yeah. So maybe there's always an inherent tension. Maybe there's an inescapable tension between the, just the idea of fiction about real people. Um, I mean, just that phrase, fiction about real people. There's mm -hmm. an inherent tension that, that you can't escape. I mean, maybe that's the real answer. Um, yeah. Uh, Katie, there is a question here. Um, let's see. Uh, as I read it, your book, oops, I'm losing this. Where are we? Oh, yeah. Um, as I read it, I'm wondering how many, if any, of the letters in the book between the characters are transcribed from the actual letters, or are they all created by you? So if you look in my, if you look, um, it, in the letters that are actually transcribed, there's an asterisk in the front of the quote and the back. So the so if it's if it's a letter that I transcribed from them, there will be a little asterisk in front and back, um, and that indicates that that is that that was a letter. If, for instance, my book opens with a letter from um, Nath from Nathaniel Hawthorne to John Stephen Dyke saying, geez, your parents are really worried about you. What's going on? You haven't written in about three months. That's, that's the gist of the letter. That was a real letter that, that was transcribed, absolutely. And Nathaniel Hawthorne, when he uh, signed his letters, he signed it Nath period. So I decided that, that, that Nath was, his, was, was his, um, his diminutive. Just like, so, so he, his, uh, his older sister, Elizabeth, um, he couldn't pronounce Elizabeth when he was little, so he called her Evie. And uh, so, and then Nath was Nath, and then Louisa was Lucy. And I learned this from the docents at the, <laughs> at the old man's. Um, so, the, so there are several letters throughout the book. 
if there's a if there's a letter that doesn't have the asterisk, that's me. And there's a particular journal entry from um, Nath at the end of the book that talks about when he found out that Louisa had died. Um, that's a journal entry um, that um, John Dyke uh, quotes, and that I wrote entirely. But I wrote it from the historical, uh, from from what I read historically, which was that. Um, Nath was home at the time. It was early in the morning. Louisa had died and been buried already, and the, Hoff, the uh, Sophia and Nath didn't know any about anything about this. And their friend William Pike came and pounded on the door and said, "Open up and open up! Uh, Louisa died in the Henry Clay steamboat disaster." And Nath was upstairs writing, and he came down and couldn't handle it and walked up and went outside for a walk up the large path and just kind of disappeared for a while. And I wrote that in my in in as if it were a journal entry from him. So, uh, this question from Carolyn: What became of John Dyke? Uh, he returned to Salem without his companion Louisa Hawthorne. Was she married? Carolyn. No, Lu Louisa never married. She she never married. She stayed in her mother's house. Um, her mother died in 1850, and Louisa stayed in that house and uh, until she died in 1852. Um, she and her and her uncle William, um, and uh, Louisa was very popular. She had whist parties, and she liked to go to parties herself. And she wore she talked about people's wardrobes, and she she had a great sense of humor in, in her letters. Um, but she never married. Um, John after after the after the fateful Henry Clay steamboat disaster, he came back to Salem and became, was a very successful merchant. Um, and died in 1871. Hmm. So that was that. Would, but I, I I say different things in my book. But that that was his. That was what happened to him historically. Uh, if I can ask you a question, uh, Katie, Aunt Priscilla, she must have been such fun to write. I mean, she was despicable. I mean, she was. <laughs> My gosh, I mean, that must have been so much fun to write her. It was fun to write her. It would be really fun to play her. <laughs> oh, yes, you could do both. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so her family letters, she just, nobody seemed to like her. She was sort of hyper-religious and nasty and said sort of weird things. And Sophia wrote and said that when um, Betsy, Betsy Hawthorne died, um, uh, Priscilla just sat there like a cold stone statue. Um, she never had any children. Um, she and John didn't have any children, even though he had two from his previous marriage. Um, there was this funny anecdote that uh, was in one of the letters about when they were all up in their um, in their Maine house. They had a they had a country house in Maine, in Richmond, Maine, and um, she killed two snakes. Uh, it, it was unclear to me whether they were garter snakes or they were in the garden or whatever. I wrote a chapter about it. But uh, and if any of, uh, anybody uh, is reading the book or has read the book, you may have noticed that there's a lot of animal imagery in it. Priscilla's very snaky. And in <laughs> fact, John's, John's first sentence is, a gorgon shares my bed and nothing is safe. I think of her as Medusa. <laughs> in fact, uh, Anne, uh, Anne writes, yes, Priscilla was the character I loved to hate. <laughs> That is great. That is good. Um, Dawn, I want to tell you that I, I, I did, I mean, I learned a lot from both of your books, and I, I'm so glad that you persevered for, you know, if it was many, many years or just a few years. Um, I learned a new word from you, Dawn, camelopard, and I had no idea what that was. <laughs> I, I thought, oh my gosh, so, so I, I had to look it up. I used the Google, mm -hmm. and uh, I was surprised to find out it's a giraffe. But mm -hmm. but did they back in the day? Did they refer to giraffes as camelopards, or or maybe camel leopards? Sorry, or, I said or maybe camel leopard. Okay. It's oh. <laughs> it's a, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't. I, you know, I got that from from some probably from some of Thoreau's writings, I'm not sure. I lose track of exactly um, where, you know, what source it came from. But yeah, it made sense to me that that would have been a, uh, a portmanteau word that uh, was uh, something that looked camel-like but was uh, spotted. So right. it's, yeah, it's interesting uh -huh. to think that there was, that there was, that they were 
showing them. I mean, one of the things that when I write about uh, the 19th century or other times, just always surprised at, I guess, how cosmopolitan time, I'm, I'm more often surprised by how cosmopolitan things were than I am surprised by how insular or, or you know, backward things were. That makes sense. I think that you go back in time and you think, oh, things, everybody didn't have much knowledge of things and they didn't have much access to resources and they didn't have much uh, and people didn't travel much. And then I read and I find, well, on the contrary, they didn't know a lot and they didn't, uh, they weren't very insular and they, uh, and they traveled more than you think and so on. So, so the giraffe in, in uh, Massachusetts uh, is part of that, I think, that you wouldn't think that was, but there were, you know, traveling circuses and, and all that sort of thing going on. Yeah. That's camel leopard, not I, I don't know how you pronounce it. I don't know how to pronounce it, but that's, I, I thought, oh yeah, that makes sense, yeah. <laughs> well, these both of these books were just wonderful and I'm so glad to have read them. And I, I just learned so much. Yes, it's historical fiction, but I mean, it springs from history. And, uh, you know, it, it just, uh, it was a delight to read them both. You know, similarities, but very different and, and different inspirations for them too. Um, a lot of writer tips, I think, came up tonight that I think are, uh, you know, would-be authors or authors right now have really appreciated your tips and your inspirations mm -hmm. and how you channeled your characters. And uh, in the case of you, Katie, going to the cemetery and, and after that, you, you could really get down to writing and it just mm -hmm. it was, it inspired you. It's almost like the ghosts. True? Mm -hmm. It, it indeed it is it is more than just like it is I mean I really felt like I was channeling her channel channeling all of them you know some, somehow somehow it was a very um, it, they wanted the story to be told and, and when and and I have to say that um, the first the first book the, my my first book where I had the agent that didn't sell um, and there was there was a lot of I'm gonna just say sex in it. And that that book didn't sell to any of the big publishers, and I think I think they didn't. I think that the people, the the spirits up in uh, Authors Ridge, didn't want that book to sell. <laughs> <laughs> and when I toned the sex down, it sold. I think hey. they were happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, as I say, they're just delightful books, and these books are available. Um, actually, the supplier is Wicked Good Books in Salem. If you missed my uh, intro beforehand. So the Hawthorne Inheritance and Concord, both books are available there. They're supplying them to the Salem Athenaeum, which is handling the sales. And there are signed book plates that will be available if you have interest in that as well. So again, thank you so much. Uh, this was just a wonderful evening um, and congratulations to you both on some really great reads.